So I'm continuing my Sunday night series on taking heed. Of course, we're going through various parts of the Bible where the Bible is, is giving the warning to take heed. We need to pay attention, take heed to certain things in our life. And I've exhausted most of the, the major topics. When I say major, it's, can, it's not that any of these topics are less important. It's just how many times the, the phrase is used of, to taking heed or beware about whatever the subject matter is. So um, tonight in Psalm 39, where we started off there, you can see in verse number one, the Bible says, I said, I will take heed to my ways that I sin not with my tongue. I will keep my mouth with a bridle while the wicked is before me. So we're going to be preaching tonight. Topic, obviously, is sinning with your tongue. We need to take heed. And it's, it's almost surprising that this is only mentioned, you know, those words, take heed. Now, the concept isn't mentioned only once. There's many times there. But taking heed that we sin not with our tongue. And the reason why I say it's surprising is because I think this is probably one of the easiest sins to commit. Sinning with your tongue, saying something that you should not be saying. There's so many ways that we can do that. You know, the, the, the number one thing that probably pops up in most people's mind is just telling a lie. That's one way to sin with your tongue. But that's not the only way. There's actually many, many more, maybe even easier ways that we can be sinning with our tongue. And there's even un other sins that we can do where the things that we say kind of go hand in hand with other actions that we're doing and, and we, we kind of add sin on top of our sin by sinning with our mouth or singing, sinning with our tongue. So I do want to take a little bit of time here though and, and this psalm is very interesting with, with David and what, what he says here in this psalm and we're going to uh, kind of do a little expository on this, this psalm tonight before we get into some other some other things that, that we really need to be paying attention to. So here we have David. He's already sinned against God in this psalm and, and what he's going through. And he's basically reaping what he's sown. So whatever the exact instance is, we don't know, but we can gather from reading the whole psalm that he's, he's reaping something from God. So he's saying here, I'm going to take heed to my ways and I'm not going to sin with my tongue. I'm going to keep my mouth shut, basically is what he's saying. I'm going to keep my mouth with a bridle while the wicked is before me. So I'm not even going to say anything. And you remember, you know, he, he exhibited this type of behavior when he was being cursed, right? As he was leaving Jerusalem when Absalom was kind of taking over the kingdom and he was crossing over the river and he was being cursed and he said, you know, let him alone. Like, you know, maybe the Lord told him to curse me this day. And he was just keeping his mouth shut. He's holding his tongue. And then it says in verse 2, I was dumb with silence. I held my peace even from good. So he took it actually a little bit too far because he's saying, I held my tongue. I held my peace. I didn't say anything even from good, even from saying good things. And my sorrow was stirred. So we want to take heed when we are making sure we're not sinning with our mouth, we're not saying foolish things, we're not charging God foolishly, we're not lying, we're not doing those other things. But in our zeal or desire to not sin with our mouth, we also want to make sure that we're not withholding from good things, the things that we ought to be saying. And he says here, his sorrow was stirred. Verse 3, my heart was hot within me while I was musing, the fire burned. Then spake I with my tongue. So then he's like, I couldn't hold in anymore, right? I, I, I was trying to keep my mouth shut, I was trying to hold in, and I finally couldn't, and I, and I had to open up my mouth. Verse 4, Lord, make me to know mine end and the measure of my days, what it is, that I may know how frail I am. Behold, thou hast made my days as an handbreadth, and mine age is as nothing before thee. Verily, every man at his best estate is altogether vanity. So he's recognizing how frail and fragile he really is and that, and that without God's protection and, and, and with God's everything, you know, he's, he's basically humbling himself before the Lord. And, of course, it's the attitude that we ought to have as well, just being very humble before God. Verse 6, Surely every man walketh in a vain show. Surely they are disquieted in vain. He heapeth up riches and knoweth not who shall gather them. And now, Lord, what wait I for? My hope is in thee. Deliver me from all my transgressions. Make me not the reproach of the foolish. I was dumb. 
I opened not my mouth because thou didst it. And this is where we get the understanding that whatever it is that he's, he's refraining from speaking and from the wicked people that are before him, he's not opening his mouth, he says, because he knows it's from God. He knows it's from the Lord. So he's not, you know, what, if we're being wronged, if we, if we have some judgment or some punishment coming against us, we ought not to be opening up our mouth. Oh, man, I can't believe all this is going on. Well, yeah, you should be able to believe it if you're reaping what you've sown. I mean, if you're, he, he says it's clear. David at least is recognizing, you know what? God's doing this. God's allowing this to happen, and it's for something that I did. And he's humbling himself. He want, you know, basically, he wanted it to stop, but he's not going to open up his mouth and complain about it or say anything about it because it's his own accord. Verse 10, all he's going to do is talk to God about it. He's remove thy stroke away from me. I am consumed by the blow of thine hand. When thou with rebukes dost correct man for iniquity, thou makest his beauty to consume away like a moth. Surely every man is vanity. Selah. Hear my prayer, O Lord, and give ear unto my cry. Hold not thy peace of my tears, for I am a stranger with thee, and a sojourner as all my fathers were. O spare me that I may recover strength before I go hence and be no more. Now, at the beginning of this, of this psalm, in verse number one, it said, I will take heed to my ways that I sin not with my tongue. There's another very similar phrase found in the book of Job. If you remember when all those bad things happened to Job, he, had, he was attacked by Satan. He had all kinds of horrible things happen to him, but he didn't sin with his lips. The Bible is very explicit about that. In Job chapter one, verse 22, turn if you would to James chapter three. In Job 1, 22, the Bible says, in all this, Job sinned not, nor charged God foolishly. So if he would have charged God, saying, God, why did you do this to me? God, why are you bringing all this bad heartache on me? Why did you take my children? Why did you take my goods? That would have been foolish to do because God wasn't doing that to him. God wasn't just taking everything away from him. Satan was. And the Bible's commending him here, saying he didn't sin. Because sometimes we can say things, we react, and we speak too quickly, and we end up sinning with our lips. And especially when bad things happen, that's, it's, it's, it's probably the most common time for people to be saying things even to God that they ought not to say and charging God and saying, God, why did you allow this to happen? Why, you know, and, and maybe even blaming God for doing things that, that he didn't do. And then in Job 2, verse number 9, when his own wife turns on him, it says, then, his, then says his wife unto him, dost thou still retain thy integrity? Curse God and die. Like she's even telling him, like, look, just curse God. But he does retain his integrity, and Job's not going to curse God. He's not charging him foolishly. He answers her, says, but he said unto her, thou speakest as one of the foolish women speaketh. What? Shall we receive good at the hand of God, and shall we not receive evil? In all this did not Job sin with his lips. Sinning with our lips. This is what we need to take heed to tonight. We're going to take heed to our mouth, to our lips, to our tongue, to saying things that we ought not to say. James chapter 3 is an excellent passage that covers how damaging our tongue can be and, and how great a matter a little fire kindled. Look at verse number 1 of James chapter 3. The Bible says, My brethren, be not many masters, knowing that we shall receive the greater condemnation. For in many things we offend all. If any man offend not in word, the same as a perfect man, and able also to bridle the whole body. He's saying if you don't offend anybody with, with what comes out of your mouth, you're a perfect man. Look, we all say things that offend somebody sometimes. And we all say things that are incorrect sometimes. We all say things that we shouldn't say sometimes. But what he's demonstrating also is saying if you're able to control your mouth and your words, you'll be able to control your whole body. That's an aspect to if you if you could gain control of just of your tongue and be in what you speak, that demonstrates your ability to control. I mean, think about this. If you have fleshly desires and struggles with sin that you deal with in your body, if you're able to take care of what comes out of your mouth, you'll be able to handle all the rest of, of the areas of your body because it's so hard to get control of the things that you say. And if you could demonstrate that level of control over your mouth, 
then you'll be able to control everything else as well in, the, in, in any other areas you're having a problem with. Verse number three, the Bible says, Behold, we put bits in the horses' mouths that they may obey us, and we turn about their whole body. Behold also the ships, which though they be so great and are driven of fierce winds, yet are they turned about with a very small helm, whithersoever the governor listeth, even so. So in like manner, in like manner that we use bits in the horse's mouth, that, that, that whatever, it's a bit, right, that, that you put in there, that when you pull this way or this way, you control the entire direction of the horse. Or the little rudder on the bottom of a boat that, you know, it's a small piece, but that determines which way this huge, great vessel is going to turn. If you can control your tongue, it can control the direction of your life. And the path that you're going to take, if you're able to maintain that type of control, it says, even so the tongue is a little member and boasteth great things. Behold how great a matter a little fire kindleth. Your tongue can get you into a lot of sticky situations, right? The, 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 the words that you let come out of your mouth can be a great blessing or can cause all kinds of, of problems, right? And, and people get mad at you and, and dig yourself into a ditch, um, a little fire, and we've seen this before, we see this here, we experience it firsthand with the, uh, the fires that start in, in the area, how they can get out of control and just destroy and devastate and, and anything in its path gets, gets burned down. And it's likening our tongues to that type of a fire that you could just, you, could, you can spit out with your mouth a little spark and set off a huge forest fire, a huge blaze just based off of what you say verse number six and the tongue is a fire a world of iniquity so is the tongue among our members that it defileth the whole body and setteth on fire the course of nature and it is set on fire of hell i think everyone probably has known someone at some point in their life that just didn't know when to keep their mouth shut people who just want to and i mean i knew some guys that anytime we would go out somewhere they would just end up saying things they'd be picking fights or they'd be saying things just just that you know it's just going to lead to no good. Like, why, why do you even have to open up your mouth? Why can't you just keep your mouth shut and just, you know, cause all these problems? And not just that. I mean, there's, there's so many ways that we can bring problems upon ourselves by the things that we say. Uh, anyone in, in relationships know that you get angry or upset with somebody. You end up saying things that, that could cause a lot of damage. Our words can do a lot of damage to people. They could do a lot of good and help and healing. They could also do a lot of damage. I think that it's more capable of doing even more damage than good if we're not careful with what comes out of our mouth because once you let something go, there's no, there's no pulling that back. There's no, it's not like on the computer where you can start typing a response to somebody and then hit the backspace before you actually sit, hit enter. Right? You could, you could have a little bit more temperance and control when it comes to that we need to have that same level of control in our minds as if we're, we're typing out the things we're going to say and we're thinking about it enough to where we could we could say oh wait you know what that's actually a bad idea i don't want to do that and and withhold that before it actually comes out of our mouth because once you hit enter it's out there once you hit once you you open up your mouth and speak it's there and if you say things that's going to be very hurtful to somebody else, you know, once you say it, no matter how much you apologize or ask for you to say, I, I shouldn't have said it, that was wrong, it doesn't change the fact that you said it. And oftentimes people can say things that can get very, very hurtful and nasty and mean and things that you know aren't right. And once it's out there, you, it, it does more damage. You, you can't always just make up for that. So we need to be very careful in the things that we say and not allow our tongues to just start these great fires and disasters in our lives because the disaster is not going to be good. And we have a lot, we have control. We ought to have control over the things that we say. Let's keep reading here in verse number seven in James three. The Bible says, for every kind of beasts and of birds and of serpents and of things in the sea is tamed and hath been tamed of mankind, but the tongue can no man tame. It is an unruly evil full of deadly poison. Therewith, bless we God, even the Father. And therewith, curse we men, which are made after the similitude of God. 
Out of the same mouth proceedeth blessing and cursing. My brother, in these things ought not so to be. Doth a fountain send forth at the same place sweet water and bitter? Can the fig tree, my brethren, bear olive berries, either a vine, figs? So can no fountain both yield salt water and fresh. Who is a wise man and endued with knowledge among you? Let him show out of a good conversation his works with meekness of wisdom. But if you have bitter envying and strife in your hearts, glory not and lie not against the truth. Now, bitter envying is where you're envying. You, you, you have, you, someone else has something you wish you had, and you're bitter about it. That right there, that problem of the heart, is going to manifest itself in the things that you say, as well as strife. It says in strife in your hearts. If you have problems with people, it's going to come out through your, through your words and through your actions. And the strife in your heart needs to be taken care of. The bitter envying needs to be taken care of. But one thing that you ought to be able to control is what comes out of your mouth. Because it's going to take that, that sinfulness inside of you and just multiply it that much more when you actually start opening up and, and letting all of this come out. He says, glory not and lie not against the truth. Verse 15, the wis this wisdom descends not from above, but is earthly, sensual, devilish. For where envying and strife is, there is confusion in every evil work. But the wisdom that is from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle and easy to be entreated, full of mercy and good fruits, without partiality and without hypocrisy. And the fruit of righteousness is sown in peace of them that make peace. So there's a contrast here between the bitter envying and strife in your hearts and then the wisdom that's from above. The peaceable stuff, the, the, the good stuff, the pure, gentle, easy to be entreated. And this all ties in. You say, well, what does this have to do with, with your mouth and your lips? It, it makes perfect sense. Because the wisdom that is sensual, earthly, devilish, that causes, that, that comes from the bitter envying and strife in your hearts is going to cause the big flames. It's going to cause the big destruction from your mouth. But when you use the wisdom from above, you're going to be, it's going to bring peace. That's why the Bible says the fruit, of, the fruit of righteousness is sown in peace of them that make peace. You'll be using your words to make peace with people, not to, not to cause extra problems. So the, the words that you're going to use will be pure words, peaceable, gentle, easy to be entreated, full of mercy and good fruits, not being partial to anybody or anything, and without hypocrisy, saying things, and that's an important one, being able to say words without hypocrisy. Now, I wanted to kind of blow through that because that just underscores, James chapter 3 underscores how important it is to take heed to our words and how much damage can be done. But I want to get very specific on some things and um, areas that, that many people struggle with. And to be honest with you, it's, it's kind of a shame. And this is that double-edged sword of, of social media being able to, for people to put things out there and, and say things that they probably wouldn't even say in a public setting or they wouldn't say in, in other settings. But for whatever reason, people feel like they could do things on Facebook or Twitter or whatever social media you use these days. I don't know. I'm probably getting outdated with some of this stuff. But um, it's all the same thing. It's all the same problem. Turn, if you would, to 1 Timothy chapter 5. 1 Timothy chapter 5. Now, 1 Timothy chapter 5, we're talking about, in the context here, we're specifically talking about widows and widows that are widows indeed and, um, you know, younger widows being commanded to marry and to bear children in God's house and, and to do these things that they would just um, get remarried if they're a younger widow. And one of the warnings of a, wi of a widow not getting married it's not just for widows, but this can apply to anybody. Okay, this is, this is a sinful nature that, that can happen to anybody, but specifically 
This is one of the reasons why widows ought to get remarried. Verse number 13, the Bible says, And with all they learn to be idle, wandering about from house to house, and not only idle, but tattlers also, and busybodies, speaking things which they ought not. I will, therefore, that the younger women marry, bear children, guide the house, give none occasion to the adversary to speak reproachfully. Now, I think some people look at this and say, oh, that's talking to the widows. It's not talking to me. So it just kind of goes in one ear and out the other. But if it's not good for the widows to be tattlers and to be busybodies and to be speaking things which they ought not, it's not good for anyone to be doing that. The reason why he's applying it to widows is because if you're not a widow, if you're married and you have a family, you should be busy enough to not even get involved with this stuff. That's the thinking is that you know, you're married, you're, the husband will help take control of these things, and the husband ought to be helping to take control of these. Men, if your wives have a problem with this, you need to get involved because this is not right. It's not of God. There's so much gossip and tattlers and busybodies now on social media. And then one of the reasons that I think wives and people who ought to not have enough time for this do have enough time because it used to be where if you're going to go talk trash about someone, you'd have to actually physically be at that, you know, some other person's house, getting involved in other affairs and actually be talking a lot and be out of your house and talking to other people about it. But it's made so much more convenient and easy that you can stay right at home now and gather and collect all this information about people and talk about it with everybody else. And this is, look, this is a wicked thing. This hurts a lot of people. When you get people together and they start talking and just talking crap about people, and I'm sick of people that think that it's okay for them in their situation to just be talking crap about people and just think they're always justified. And there's always a reason why it's okay for me to talk bad about this person or that person or this person. That person. Now look, I know that there are some times when it's appropriate or important to call out a wolf, a false prophet, someone who's doing damage, someone who, hey, we need to be warned and pull the sheep clothing off of a wolf and let everybody know, hey, this is a wolf. There may also be some instances where somebody needs to receive a public rebu rebuke because they're a public figure and they're publicly doing things that are not right, that are wrong, that are steering a bunch of people away. Those things may require a public rebuke, okay? But I'll tell you what, the instances that require such things and such, you know, communication and things that ought to be said is not just happening all the time. But what we see happening, what I see happening, what I know happens, and I know this for a fact, I've seen it, is that you get people, and, and mostly these, it's mostly women, but it's not always just women. Men get involved in this too. They get their little sewing circles online, their private Facebook groups that nobody else can see, their own little message system where they can all talk and, and you got people talking back and forth, and then you got some other people that got their private accounts that are anonymous and no one knows, and they're taking screenshots, and oh, can you believe this person's saying this and this person's saying that, and did you know this person said this? And it's just a bunch of gossip, and it's wrong, and it's wicked, and it shouldn't be happening at all. People talking bad about this person and that person at church, and this person and this person said this, and that person did that. It's ridiculous. It's ridiculous. But this, this is a lot, this, this type of sin that does come naturally, especially more so with women than with men, because of the accessibility and the easeability, of, the, the usability of being able to get on from the comfort of your own home and have all this communication with people, it's so easy. And the temptation is for people to want to know what is, what's all the juicy details? What's going on with this person? What, and it's easy to get wrapped up into that. Oh man, what's going on? But that's what gossip is. Why do you need to know? Why does anyone care? Why, why do people need to know so bad? What, you know, if someone does wrong to this person and they lied about that person, it's like, so what? You don't even know who these people, people who get involved in most of this stuff, it's like they don't even know each other. They've never met each other before. They're just these friends on Facebook and ends up causing all kinds of division and drama and, and, you know, these screenshots get out and they said this and see, look, I copied this and it's right here and it's like, 
everyone's sharing this and sending this, and it's like, is this what you want to spend your time doing? Is this profitable for anything? What good is going to come out of this? Nothing. And it's wicked, and it's sinful. And I don't care if you're not audibly saying the words, if you're typing them down on the keyboard, it's the same concept. You're still being a tattler. You're tattling on people. You know, so-and-so said this about you. Why, why are you bringing it up? What's the purpose? And the gossiping, it, it makes me sick. And I'm talking people who ought to know better, too. I'm not even just talking about random people that I don't know. There are people I do know. It makes me sick to see why. Why, why the continuous gossip and things just being put out there? It doesn't make any sense. And you know what else doesn't matter? It doesn't matter if what you're saying is true. It can still be gossip. Just because you're saying, you say, well, I'm not lying. I mean, it's the truth. Yeah, but there's not always a reason for you to just say everything that goes on and everything that everyone says and be a talebearer and a revealer of secrets and just sowing discord. You know, this goes hand in hand with lying in the sense that God hates both of them. In the book of Proverbs, we went through this when we did our study in the book of Proverbs. But in Proverbs 6, verse 16, the Bible says, These six things that the Lord hate, yea, seven are an abomination unto him. God thinks it's abominable when people sin with their mouth. And here's what he lists off. He says, a proud look. Now, what's interesting is a proud look often will lead to a proud mouth, won't it? When you lift yourself up, you have a proud look. God hates a proud look. You think it's abominable. So be careful with even the things that you say, being too proud and lifted up in yourself and boasting of yourself. A lying tongue and hands that shed innocent blood and heart that deviseth wicked imaginations. When your heart's devising wicked imaginations, guess what? It's going to come out of your mouth as well. Feet that be swift to, to running to mischief, a false witness that speaketh lies, and he that soweth discord among brethren. Two of those have to do with lying. Of the seven things that the Bible says that God thinks is abominable, two of them have to do with directly your mouth telling lies about people, spreading false witness, saying, I saw this or I saw that when you didn't see it, and sowing discord among the brethren. And the most common way for people to sow discord among the brethren is with their mouth. Sinning with their mouth. Look, we need to take heed. There's a lot of damage can come and there's so much damage that can be done. That's why God says he hates it. It's abomination to him. It ought not so to be. The Bible says in Proverbs 26, 28, a lying tongue hateth those that are afflicted by it. So when you tell lies and you're lying about people and slandering people, you hate the person that you're talking about. Because you don't care who's afflicted by it. And it says, in a flattering mouth worketh ruin. Turn if you would to Ephesians chapter 4. Ephesians chapter number 4. And you know what? If you have too much of a problem with, with the getting involved in the gossip and knowing all the juicy details of all the stuff that's going on in the internet world of who's doing what and who's doing wrong to who and who said what and, and all this other nonsense, then maybe it's best to just unplug. Just, just get away from it. Just turn the stupid thing off because who cares? I mean, what are you really missing anyways? Every time I ever scroll through the Facebook feed, I'm always just thinking like, this is all just stupidity anyways. I mean, sometimes there's some good stuff out there and that's the only reason why I ever get on it to begin with. But if I never got on Facebook, guess what? I really wouldn't be missing much at all, if anything, to be honest with you. It's mostly just vanity and just a, a place where people get all upset over different things. And, and it seems to me to almost cause more problems than it causes good. Ephesians chapter 4. It's going to be a shorter sermon tonight. I'm almost done. I actually got only like one, one or two other points to make. But, um, it, but it, it's still a big deal. I mean, taking heed to our tongue. Making sure we're not saying things that we ought not to say. And getting involved in, in this type of sin is a big deal. Ephesians chapter 4, verse number 24. The Bible says, And that you put on the new man, which after God is created in righteousness and true holiness. 
Wherefore, putting away lying, speak every man truth with his neighbor, for we are members one of another. And again, like I mentioned before, you know, it's not always, you know, yes, we ought to speak truth, of course. We need to not be just telling lies and not be a liar. We need to be walking in the spirit, which is what this is in uh, being contrasted against. But we need to walk in the spirit, put on the new man. And when we put on a new man, we need to put away the lying and, and just telling falsehoods and speak every man the truth. We need to be speaking the truth, but sometimes even speaking the truth is not appropriate in different situations. It's just, just there's no reason to say some of those things. So you, you say nothing at all. Verse number 26, the Bible says, Be ye angry and sin not. Let not the sun go down upon your wrath. Now, when we get angry, is one of the easiest times to, to sin with our mouth. When we get angry. Because when someone gets anger, your temperance, your control is tested. I mean, when you're, when you're in a good mood and you're not angry at all, it could be very easy just not to say things, let things roll off of you, not, you know, not respond, not say nasty things, because you're not upset. But when you get upset, when you get angry, that's when you need to be careful to not sin. It's not always wrong to get angry. If someone does you wrong, it's not wrong to have an emotion of anger, but how you deal with that is very important. Because even when someone does you wrong, it's not, it's, not always right, you know, it's not right to just lash out at them with your tongue than and say some things that maybe go above and beyond even whatever else happened and you're, start, you know, you're perpetuating fights and drama and problems that you don't need and maybe you even say things that just ought not to have been said. And that's why it says, be angry and sin not. Let not the, the sun go down upon your wrath. You ought to be able to, to forgive and let go and move forward and not retain bitterness. You know, don't let this, you know, we get angry. Don't hold on to that anger. Don't let the sun go down and you're still angry during the day. Just, just be able to let it go. It says, neither give place to the devil. Let him that stole steal no more, but rather let him labor working with his hands. The thing which is good that he may have to give to him that needeth. Let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth, but that which is good to the use of edifying, that it may minister grace unto the hearers. This is a great principle to use on how we ought to be speaking and, and the things that we ought to say. Not allowing corrupt communication to proceed out of our mouth. And corrupt isn't just lying. It's just anything that could be wicked or bad or wrong that we shouldn't be saying. But that which is good for the use of edifying. What does edifying do? It lifts other people up. And, you know, there's that old adage, if you, know, if you have nothing nice to say, don't say it at all. There's a lot of wisdom to that statement. There's a lot of wisdom to that statement. We, we ought not to just be saying things unless you got something nice to say. Why? Because saying something nice to people is going to help lift them up. It's going to edify them. Now, it's not completely true, right? Because there are some times that another person may not consider what you're saying to be nice, but it ultimately is going to help them and it's something that they may need to hear. We need to show tact. We need to, to show wisdom in, in those instances where we may have to tell somebody something because we love them that they don't want to hear. I mean, the biggest example is telling someone that they're going to go to hell if they don't believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, right? That may not be something that they want to hear. It may not be something that they would say is nice to say to them, but it really is nice because you are trying to help them. You may have friends that need correction in an area and, and spiritually as a brother or sister in Christ, you see something going on here. You see something wicked and sinful in their life and you need to say something to them if you love them. But there's ways of doing that. And you know, one of the ways of doing that is not displaying it for the world to see or telling other people about their problems and spreading rumors and gossip. You deal with them individually. And your goal is to edify them, to build them up, to strengthen them because you're helping to point out an area where, hey man, this is gonna, this is gonna do you a lot of damage or a lot of harm if you continue going down this path. If you continue doing this, look, you need to get right. You need to get right with God because I love you and I care about you. Let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth, but 
that which is good to the use of edifying, that it may minister grace unto the hearers. These are the things that we need to be focused on speaking and, and, and how we ought to be, um, the communication we ought to have out of our mouth. Verse number 30, And grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby ye are sealed unto the day of redemption. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice. And be ye kind one to another, tender hearted, forgiving one another, even as God for Christ's sake hath forgiven you. Too many battles of words between people that cause bitterness and the evil speaking just, just increases. And instead of being tender hearted, and forgiving and being kind one to another people get carried away with their words and just get caught up in this back and forth and, and spewing venom at each other watch out for that don't fall into that trap if you got someone falsely accusing you you don't have to defend yourself to them you don't have to get caught up and sink down to their level you can just let it go it's the right way of dealing with things most of the time. Like I said, there may be some people who, who are trying to sneak in and, and infiltrate and whatever. And yeah, does, does something like that need to be made known? Sure, because you want to warn people that, hey, this person's really a snake. They're, they're a two-timer and just let them know that's the type of person that they're dealing with in general. There's nothing wrong with that. But once that's already established and done, is there really a point to just keep on hammering home and look, they did this now and then just keep following. What are they doing now? Oh, they're doing this and just, just turn into just railers and railing on other people who, yeah, they were in sin, but now you just keep promoting this and, and you're, you're holding this root of bitterness and won't let it go. Turn if you would to Ephesians 5. It's the last place I'll have you turn. Ephesians chapter 5. There's this one other point that I wanted to bring up when it comes to sinning with our lips, taking heed to what we say. The big one is the gossiping and the, and the um, lying and those types of things. But Ephesians chapter 5, we're going to see one other area here where we ought to be careful for as well. And this one might pertain a little bit more to the men than the ladies. Uh, you know, the, the ladies have more of a hard time with the gossiping and and getting involved in that type of, of conversation and, and saying things that maybe they ought not to or revealing secrets or the, what, you know, things like that. But men have a problem too. And I, it's not that either one can't do these things, but some are a little bit more apt for, for one, one uh, gender than the other. Look at verse number one of Ephesians 5. The Bible says, Be ye therefore followers of God as dear children and walk in love as Christ also hath loved us and hath given himself for us an offering and a sacrifice to God for a sweet-smelling savor. But fornication and all uncleanness or covetousness, let it not be once named among you as becometh saints. Neither filthiness, nor foolish talking, nor jesting which are not convenient, but rather giving of thanks. So he's listing off a lot of things. He's saying, you know what? If you're a child of God, fornication, uncleanness, covetousness, these things, these attributes, they ought not to even be named among you. Like, that's not who you ought to be. You ought not to have these qualities. And then he continues on, he says, neither filthiness nor foolish talking. So what's foolish talking? Just a bunch of stupidity. Having stupid conversations that don't mean anything, that maybe you're talking about sin, maybe you're talking about just things that just the foolishness of this world. Having, you know, and I'll tell you what, there's a lot of guys that get involved in foolish talking. There's a lot of conversations that are really dumb and meaningless and stupid and foolish. And the Bible's listing these off. Look, that's sinful. It says, nor jesting, which are not convenient. Now, I don't think the Bible's saying that every single, you know, like every single joke, if you ever say a joke, is bad. But there are definitely people who can't be sober that can't be serious, that everything is a joke to them and that they're just jesting and making light of everything. And one of the big things that people can do is joke about things that are wicked and sinful and think that that's somehow funny. Now look, you may have, as I did, used to think that those things were funny, and I did. 
And you may have to change and struggle to change what you view as humorous. Because even right now, maybe you look at something that's filthy or you hear a filthy joke and you still think that's funny. Well, shame on you. You ought to change the way that you think. And that's the truth. And I'm not saying that's going to happen overnight, but you ought to be filling your head with purity, with the good things, with things that are wholesome and pure and good from the Word of God and get that in your heart so that way you can have the proper view and disdain for the wickedness and sin and fornication and filth in this world and not just treat it as a joke because it's not a joke, because it destroys lives, because the things that people do that destroy their lives are not funny. And we ought not to be jesting about them and joking about them and having foolish conversations about these things. Jump down, and he says there in verse number five, For this ye know, that no whoremonger, nor unclean person, nor covetous man who is an idolater hath any inheritance in the kingdom of God. That's why it's so serious. That's why we don't just foolishly talk and jest about these things. He's saying because, look, this is the unsaved world. These, these wicked sins are sending people to hell because they're not inheriting the kingdom of Christ and of God. Let no man deceive you with vain words. For because of these things cometh the wrath of God upon the children of disobedience. Be not ye therefore partakers with them. He's saying don't be like them. Don't be partakers of their vain words. Verse number 8. For ye were sometimes darkness, but now are ye light in the Lord. Walk as children of light. For the fruit of the Spirit is in all goodness and righteousness and truth, proving what is acceptable unto the Lord. And have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather reprove them. Instead of having fellowship with the people who are, who are making, who are having filthy conversation and telling filthy jokes, don't be in fellowship with them and laughing with them and joking with them and get caught up in their, in their foolishness. He says, but rather reprove them and tell them they're wrong. When someone wants to come and show you some dirty thing or tell you something, you know, like, no, you're wrong. Verse number 12, for it is a shame even to speak of those things which are done of them in secret. The wicked sins that are done in secret. The Bible saying, you know, it's a shame to even, to even talk about those things, to even speak of those things. Take heed to the things that you say. Take heed to the gossip. Take heed to the hurtful things. And the best way to take heed is to, is to constantly be just trying to pay attention to not reacting instantly in any situation, but allowing yourself to have a little bit of a filter to not just say the first thing that pops into your head because that's going to get you into trouble. We need to be slow to speak and slow to wrath. We need to be quick to hear. Be ready to listen. Keep a humble heart and listen and be able to accept correction maybe if it's needed and not to just get turned around so quickly and, and, and start opening up our mouth and just spreading abroad a big blaze whether that be sowing discord among brethren, whether that be saying things that are really just hurtful to someone that you love, or whether you're just revealing secrets, you know, whatever the case, whatever that particular fire is, beware and take heed because you can do a lot of damage with just a few words. It doesn't take much. Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer. Dear Lord, we thank you so much for these warnings that we've received from your word. God, help us to, you know, this isn't a new sermon. This isn't a new topic. We've heard this before, God, but it's such an easy thing for us to do, for us to just say things that we ought not to be saying. God, help us to take control of our mouths, that we can put a bridle, as it were, in our own mouths and control our body, dear Lord, and that we might be able to know the right things to say and that we wouldn't just, just lash out or speak out in anger but that we would um, exhibit temperance and control and um, everything that we say would be, would be meaningful. And um, Lord, help us to, to identify the areas in our own lives where we need to work on and uh, to be more conformed to the image of your sons. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.